You are listening to the IoT for All Media Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the IoT for All podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Chacon, and on today's episode, we have Aaron Kelly, a content specialist and producer at Argentum Electronics. They are a company focused on providing an intelligent DC power distribution solution for commercial buildings to help them save energy and operational costs. So we talk a lot about what you can do with IoT technology with inside buildings, how buildings can save energy, and why it's important, especially now. And we wrap up by talking about the evolution of the power side of things. So we talk about where DC power came from, AC power, kind of how they compare what's being used, the, the benefits, the trade-offs, etc. Um, really good conversation. Aaron is a fantastic guest, so I really implore you to listen to this entire episode. I think it's a ton of value. But before we get into this episode, if any of you out there are looking to enter the fast-growing and profitable IoT market but don't know where to start, check out our sponsor, Leverage. Leverage's IoT solutions development platform provides everything you need to create turnkey IoT products that you can white label and resell under your own brand. To learn more, go to iotchangeseverything.com. That's iotchangeseverything.com. And without further ado, please enjoy this episode of the IoT for All podcast. Welcome, Aaron, to the IoT for All show. Thanks for being here this week. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I've been looking forward to this conversation ever since we scheduled it. Um, So let's introduce you to our audience. How about you give a quick overview of background experience and anything you think would be relevant for audience to know? Yeah, sure. So hello, everyone listening to the show. Uh, My name is Erin Kelly, and I'm the marketing coordinator for a company called Argentum Electronics. We make um, we make products that basically save commercial buildings up to 40 percent of energy. And that is through uh, by making the electricity running through the buildings more efficient by um, basically transforming the AC power that buildings get into DC power and that then distributing that DC power to uh, the connected loads like LEDs and HVACs and all, everything like that uh, because 80% of our building systems actually do require DC power. So if uh, they're getting DC power, they need it just saves them energy intrinsically. Now, when you're talking about buildings, is there a specific kind of building you all focus on or industry or vertical that you all kind of um, you know, have really been aimed aimed at? Yeah, so we focus on commercial buildings. Uh, We don't have a specific type of commercial building that we're focusing on right now, though we have worked with companies like Ellis Dawn. We like to work in the real estate value chain. And uh, we've also worked with companies like HH Angus and um, a few others. We've worked with also a a residential apartment complex. So uh, that we have like a pretty broad range of commercial buildings or multifamily residential buildings that we work with. Fantastic. And talk about how all this work that you do, or at least pieces of the work that you do, tie into the IoT space. Like how is IoT kind of connected to to your company in some way? Yeah, sure. So because we decided to basically um, base our building off of like energy saving technology, we branched out a little bit from just converting AC power to DC power. And we also have a bunch of devices that uh, save energy just through their automation capabilities. And uh, so in order to have like automation capabilities, you need to have sensors because you need to be able to like sense information about different building systems like lighting and HVAC just to like check maybe for example, the brightness or air quality, just things like that. So that you can modify those things based on like what is the comfort of your employees or what will make like the systems the most energy efficient that they can be. So uh, we have those things um, and then those things you can also like control and monitor through like a cloud-based app. So that's where everything um, like integrates into the IoT space because if the internet of things is essentially things connected over the internet. Um, and so we, we do that. We basically like connect lighting and HVAC systems and a bunch of other building systems over the internet and then control them to make them more energy efficient. And as we, there were a couple other topics I actually was going to dive into, but because we're on the subject of buildings, I want to stay there for a second. When you're thinking and and discussing internally with the team, and you're talking about implementing IoT technology and your solutions into these buildings, at a high level, is energy saving the main benefit? And if so, what are the other benefits of doing this? And at the same time, do you how do you kind of view the future of smart buildings? You know, do you kind of view it as most buildings will have to be smart in the future? Um, and what does that look like? Ooh, okay. There's so many layers to that question. I'm not really <laughs> sure which one to tackle first, but uh, let's start with the benefits aside from energy efficiency, I guess. Yeah. So 
Um, there are four main benefits. There are the, there's the benefit of like saving energy with these systems. Then when you save energy, you also reduce operating costs. And uh, you can also make employees or tenants more comfortable. And yep. um, I know that there's another one. It also improves safety. So I guess that could be sure. another one because you're reducing VOCs, which are toxic compounds in the air, and you're also reducing CO2. Um, or actually, you're, you're reducing CO emissions, and CO emissions, carbon monoxide is toxic, whereas CO2 right. is non-toxic. And so you're reducing both of those gases. Fantastic. And what is the... Um... What does kind of the future look like in, you, in your opinion when it comes to smart building technology and implementation, adoption, things like that? Um, I think that there are a lot of different opinions on this and we don't really talk about the other side, like the black mirror side of things in, in our company, you know, but we talk about mainly what the benefits are for commercial buildings or for sure. many buildings becoming uh, like being integrated with smart technology in the future. And um, I think personally that yes, commercial buildings will become mainly smart in the future just because there are so many benefits to it. Um, it's kind of like so many building managers have switched their lighting, for example, from fluorescent over to LEDs and that saves their lighting just 75% in energy costs for lighting, which is a significant amount. If you add automation yep. controls to that, it saves an additional like 20 to 40 percent or something like that on, just on lighting and costs so i think like building managers will see the potential in that and then they'll feel like they're wasting money if they don't switch over to smart technologies in the future right. and then as these smart technologies become easier and easier to implement and more cheap to implement then they'll, they'll become more they'll become more proliferated into the market so uh, it'll be like a slow process, but I think it'll be worth it. So as we kind of just talking there about the future and where we think this is going, if we look into the past a little bit, why is it so important for buildings to be focusing on being energy efficient, saving money on energy, saving energy itself now, as opposed to where it was before and kind of how have we evolved to, to be able to do this better now than we were able to do it, you know, five plus years ago? Yeah, sure. Um, so let's see, I think I learned a fact the other day, it was something about how, um, well, we only started to implement like building controllers recently, like mm -hmm. that. Only, oh, actually, let's talk about occupancy sensors for a second. So I know that I think that occupancy sensors became available in the 50s or 60s. So this kind of technology has been around for a while. Um, and I, I might have to like fact check on that. <laughs> but yeah, this kind of technology has been around for a while. It's just a matter of like how uh, it becomes cheaper and sure. more easy to implement. And uh, so five to 10 years ago, I'm not sure exactly where we were at, but I think that companies even still today are still switching their lights over from fluorescent or incandescent over to LEDs. And mm. so they need to do that really before they can implement smart building technology uh, because it's not really worth it if you're adjusting, like if you have smart technology built into fluorescent or incandescent bulbs, it's just, it's not worth it because you're not saving the money that you could be with LEDs. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a big part of it. I think that just technology takes a while to develop. And then also I sure. think that we've become more hyper-focused on the fight against climate change over the past five to 10 years. So building okay. managers are starting to realize the responsibility that they have to right. reduce right. the output of carbon emissions for their buildings. And uh, also we have the program called LEED. So LEED, if you don't know, LEED is a program that is basically like an international building certification program that qualifies your building as being a green building. So okay in order for people to gain points towards a LEED certification, they have to meet certain standards in their building design, such as in their building materials or their, uh, like the ways that they're saving energy, like with building automation controls and sensors and everything. So uh, there are like been certain benefits, you know, that have been put in place uh, in yep. the past little while because of climate change and everything. How about on the, the power side, like the DC power, AC power side of things, kind of where we kind of, we've kind of grown, right, from from being more AC power to DC power to handle 
uh, higher voltages in a safer way. Talk about that a little bit. And at the same time, if, if there's some audience members who may not be as familiar with this space, if you kind of break down AC and kind of what the differences are and how they're used. Oh yeah, for sure. This is such a fun topic, actually. <laughs> like it may not sound fun initially, but it is really fun. So uh, let's talk about electricity for a second. Uh, you might have heard of the War of the Currents before. Have you heard of the War of the Currents before? I have not. All right, well, let's talk about that. So in the late 1800s, there was Thomas Edison and there was Nikola mm -hmm. Tesla. I'm pretty sure that most of your audience members will have heard of the two of them, but maybe you don't know why they're famous. Um, Edison produced the world's first light bulb and it ran on AC power. And uh, then Tesla was actually, he worked for Edison for a little while before he produced AC power. I mean, yeah, before he produced AC power. So AC power is alternating current power and DC power is DC current power. Edison created the light bulb and made it work with DC power, which is direct current. And then Tesla was working on this alternative type of electricity called alternating current electricity. And okay. um, Edison didn't really like that Tesla was putting all this effort and energy into this new type of electricity. He kept like putting down Tesla's ideas. And then Tesla started working for a different company, a different hydro <laughs> company. Uh, and that hydro company really embraced his ideas. And they, end up use, they ended up using AC electricity to power the, the World Fair in the late 1800s. And mm. then um, eventually, because that brought a lot of attention to AC power. It was used for uh, for powering Niagara, Niagara's hydro plant. And so when they were able to see that you could power um, buildings within a 26 mile radius, I think it was, then they were like, okay, AC power is actually extremely powerful. It's amazing that you can transfer it to such long distances. So then AC power just kind of became the norm and uh, it won the war of the current. So, that's kind of an interesting backstory of like why we use AC power versus DC power. Okay. Um, but the reason that we continue to use AC power, like the reason that AC power went out over DC power was because you could transfer it over long distances. It's not necessarily that you couldn't do that with DC power, but with AC power, you could, uh, it was more efficient to do so because you could okay. send higher voltages over longer distances. Uh, because you could use transformers with AC power, and a transformer is something that takes a high voltage, um, a high voltage power source, and then it steps that voltage down, so that voltage can be used within a building. Because you need like only a certain mm -hmm. voltage level within your buildings, and so right. you need transformers to step down that voltage. And with DC power, um, DC power electricity, or yeah, DC electricity, it just doesn't work with transformers because of a lot of scientific reasons that I could go into, but I'm not sure yeah. the audience really wants me to go into. Uh, but basically you can use transformers with AC electricity and you can't use them with DC electricity, which makes it more okay. efficient to transmit um, AC power across long distances. Awesome. So then, so where, where are we kind of now? Is, is AC still the dominant player in the, in the space or is DC starting to become something that can be used for one reason or the other? Uh, yeah, so that's kind of, we actually have a blog article, or actually we probably have like four articles coming out uh, kind of on that topic alone, because okay. there are a lot of different, um, like there, there, so high voltage DC is actually gaining traction nowadays. Um, again, like back in the sixties, uh, that was when the first like high voltage direct current power transmission plant was invented. And uh, they were able to do that by um, doing this kind of like a workaround because you can't use transformers with DC electricity, but you can um, use uh, what's called a rectifier. And so you can take DC electricity and then rectify it and then turn it mm. into AC electricity, use a transformer, step down the voltage, then use a transformer or use a rectifier again and then transform that AC voltage that's now lower into a DC voltage. Um, so that's how that was their little workaround so that they would be able to transmit this high voltage DC power, uh, but it's only worth it to do so because rectifiers are extremely expensive. Uh, so you, you have to like think about the cost of rectifiers when you think about the cost of implementing a, uh, a, a this, this, this station that okay. transmits DC power. Um, so basically if you are tra transmitting power, um, past 600 kilometers, then the cost, like the energy saving costs of DC power 
uh, makes up for the cost of the rectifiers, basically. So it has okay. to be this certain distance in order for the cost for rectifiers to be worth it. That's all super interesting. Like, yes. I, I don't know if I've, <laughs> I've had a conversation where we dove all the way back to Edison and Tesla and talked about the, the whole backstory to get to where yeah. we are now. So that was super fascinating. What, do you have a, do you have cool. a background in, like, how, where'd you learn all, like, was this stuff you learned before you, you were at the company or is this stuff you learned while you were at the company? Like, where, where does this interest come from? Uh, I learned most of it while I was at the company, but I started working at this company because, um, well, one, I have my background in marketing. That's my main focus, yeah. obviously, but I do have a very strong interest in technology. Um, I've built two computers. A lot of people build computers. It's not really that impressive, but I like to mention that just because it shows <laughs> how interested I am in technology. And yeah. uh, and yes, and also like I remember when I was in high school science class, and we learned about circuits and we built our own circuits. That was interesting to me. We also That's built awesome. like um, we also built like tic tac toe boards when I was in university. And that was fun too. So I always liked playing with circuits whenever I got the chance to in school. But um, yep. aside from at this job, I've never had the opportunity before or the need to really look into circuits or learn about them. So that's how, like, that's why I learned a lot of the stuff that I know now from this job. But that's I mean, awesome. you can learn a lot if you're dedicated to it for eight hours a day yeah. for like just five months I've been working there. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, if someone has a marketing content creation type background, getting into the tech space and being able to play a role, I think the tech space is probably where the biggest, from what I've seen, biggest need for uh, people who really understand marketing and content creation to translate the technology lingo and, and, and conversation to the people that may not necessarily be as tech savvy, but need to understand how it works, what to do and the benefits of it for their business. So I imagine when you're talking to and building content for, um, to promote the brand to, to to potential buyers, you're having to kind of break this all down into a way that resonates with the the buyer themselves and the interest on their side. Um, so I imagine there, and I'd be curious to get your opinion on what some of those those challenges are like. Um, being able to kind of go from general marketing background into a technology space, and how you've been able to apply that to help the business grow through marketing and content efforts, um, which I think a lot of our audience could probably benefit from understanding on kind of what you've seen work and, and how that's kind of uh, kind of complemented the growth of the company. Yeah, sure. So you want me to talk about how I break down these more complicated topics into uh, topics that can be more easily digested, right, from a marketing standpoint and for customers? Yeah, in a sense. So like, yeah. you know, we're, you have a background that's not, I mean, it's, not, it's uh, it dabbles in tech, but it's not a tech focused backgrounds in yeah. marketing and such, but you've come into a tech space now, right? And mm -hmm. there are, I think, principles that the tech space can benefit from people who understand marketing at, at a deeper level to benef help benefit their growth. And I'd be curious if you could just talk about kind of the lessons you've kind of learned, the things you kind of push for um, that maybe some of our audience could benefit from understanding how marketing in the tech space kind of works. Yeah, sure. Um, so something that I know about marketing in the tech space is that there are very few people who are, or maybe it's not that there are a few people, but there are very, you have to be like skilled in order to be a technic, like a tech copywriter, like a copywriter sure. who writes about technology. And then those, um, those people in marketing end up being a little bit more expensive as contractors or as freelancers, just because they're taking on not only marketing responsibilities, but also the responsibility to do some research and find reliable sources and, and be able to write at some, write about something, uh, that's more complicated, uh, and deep, but from a more, uh, as you said before, like high level. So something that was a little right. bit, yeah, just a little bit more easy to understand. So, um, I think that. I think that people in the tech field, like for example, when I came to work with Argentum, they were great and like the team is fantastic, uh, but they were all engineers. And so they did need sure. help with their marketing strategy, obviously that's why I was hired. So um, I think that it's something that's important for marketers to realize that they have a lot of knowledge that people in the tech space don't have. And that's very important because they need to be able, like every company needs to be able to relate to human beings on a personal level. And they need to be right. able to make technology something that everyone can find interesting and be able to relate to, especially when technology is so crucial in fighting the climate crisis. Um, because the better technology we have, the more energy efficient our technology is, 
Um, I think personally, the more quickly we can reduce carbon emissions. And so when you're able to put that message across to building managers uh, who are potential customers, or when you're able to put that message across to the general public or to even um, Gen Z, then they can take on that message and think about how right. interesting that is. Maybe it, will, maybe it will inspire them to be in the tech space or help them realize that, um, that it is something that is important to learn about. So- right. Uh, yeah, like that's why marketing is so important um, in the tech space. And yeah, like marketers just need to learn a little bit, like ask questions to the engineers and then try and like repeat back the information that you got from them so that they can say, yes, you're right about that or no, like this is the correction um, to make that statement more accurate. So, I mean, that's how I've learned is I've just listened to what my what my coworkers have talked about and then asked a bunch of questions. I also have these things that I do consistently with one of the head engineers called Tech Talks, where he and I just get together a couple of times a month and then I ask him a bunch mm. of questions that came up about the technology and then he explains things to me or gives me resources. Right. That's really helpful too. That's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. I appreciate you diving into that. Um, the, so as we wrap up, I have two questions that I actually wanted to ask you at the beginning, but we got so <laughs> like driven into 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 uh, talking about the buildings that I w didn't want to pivot away. Of course. So um, you you all are located in Canada, correct? Yes. Okay. I, I'm curious because I actually had someone on earlier that is in South Africa. And we were talking about the IoT landscape in cool. in Africa, which is different than what I'm used to here in the states, and it's different than when I've talked to guests in Europe. So from your perspective, even though we you know Canada is very close to the U.S., how is the landscape? Uh, in from for IoT up in up up in that space, you can take it from you know from a company standpoint, like the providers of IoT kind of ecosystem or adoption use case focus kind of thing. I'm just curious for your take on how the Canadian IoT market uh, may differ than other markets you're familiar with. That's a really good question. I I'm not sure exactly. I feel like I wouldn't really be able to give you a full answer to that question. But what I could probably comment on about that is that. Just from my perspective, I feel like there are less um, less tech companies doing what we do here in Canada. Um, okay. Like whenever I look up our competitors, a lot of them just seem to be more U.S. based. Like the vast majority of them are seem to be in the U.S. Um, yep. And whenever I come across one that's Canadian, I get kind of excited about it because I'm like, oh, it's cool that someone else is doing this. Right. <laughs> it's fine if we have a little bit of competition. That's okay. It'll push the market forward, and I'm happy about that. Definitely. Uh, yeah. So that's really all I have to say about that. Yeah. From from my perspective, it it seems like the markets are similar from a ecosystem makeup standpoint. Um, I definitely have seen more startup focused companies especially in the us kind of jumping into iot and building things um, but i'm very curious to see and follow the applications and use cases that maybe gear more or i guess what companies that are in canada in the iot space what use cases and applications they focus on do they stay more regionally focused do they try to go global do they try to compete and sell into the us market i'm very curious to kind of watch mm -hmm. how these other country mar and, and markets start to bleed into each other because obviously u.s companies are trying to focus on the u.s but then they're now expanding globally which i'm sure is a natural progression for canadian companies as well i'm just curious if canada has unique applications and use cases that may be more prevalent up there as opposed to in the u.s i think that's where i'm kind of keeping my eye on the most to see how things evolve right yeah that makes sense for sure uh so our company even though we're located in canada we have two locations in canada one in toronto and then one in coburg um, okay. We do we do do business with companies internationally too. Like we're happy to nice. work with nice. companies in uh, or you know buildings that are located in America or really anywhere throughout right. the world because it's very simple to install our system. Uh, it really is kind of just like a plug and play system, and then our sensors are all wireless, and then everything is just kind of synced up with the building uh, with the building systems, um, kind right. of like with their own software in the background, gotcha. like by the engineers here in Canada. So, uh, we don't really have any restrictions on where we can work. I think that that's been a real benefit. Uh, like it's, it's been something positive, at least that's come out of the pandemic is that more people are adjusting to working remotely and they're figuring out ways to right, right. like make sure that they can, um, that they can do things remotely. And our system is no exception to that at all. 
Uh, Fantastic. Yeah, so that's that's nice. I feel like maybe being in Canada, we have maybe a smaller pool of potential clients. So it's nice to be able to expand our pool by yep. being able to have things installed kind of remotely. That's awesome. Last question I have for you before we wrap up. Um, so obviously, if you've looked at our podcast history, we haven't had the pleasure of having that many um, female tech enthusiasts, players, experts on the podcast. I'm doing everything I can to get more on. Um, so I was very much also looking forward to, under, to learning a little bit about your experience being a, a woman in the tech space and kind of how that's been for you. And, you know, I know there's lots of opportunities and new things happening in the space in general that I'm curious to see where your interests have kind of expanded to as you've played more of a role in a tech company's growth and just just learn about that for a second. Yeah, sure. Thanks for asking that question. And I'm really like happy to hear that you're planning on getting more female guests and everything onto the podcast. I would love to listen to more podcasts where there's female guests talking about tech in a way that's Agreed. really uh, digestible, you know. Uh, yep. So for me, like the first company that I worked with that um, that was in the tech industry was back when I first graduated from university. Well, I graduated from university and then I went and I volunteered in Africa for like six months. But then after that, wow. okay. I went and I worked for a company that manufactures custom folding pocket knives. And um, okay. yeah, and so something that I learned from that experience was that it was very easy as the only woman working in this company um, that was like a team of 10 of us or something like that. And I was the only okay. woman working there and I was the only one also doing marketing. Everyone else were, uh, everyone else was working on the products um, or doing packaging or doing accounting. No one else was really working on the marketing side of things. So I found it very easy for me to devalue the work that I was doing and feel like it wasn't as, as important as the work that my male coworkers were doing. And uh, so something that I would like to say to other females in the tech industry is don't devalue your work, work on your craft and maybe also work to understand what your what your coworkers are doing. But it doesn't ma it doesn't matter if they're men or women. What matters is the value that you bring to the company. And yeah. uh, so just focus on that and uh, and have regular communications with your boss. Um, something that I do with this company with uh, Argentum is we actually have like morning meetings and we have evening weekend uh, meetings. So we have like a meeting at 9 a.m. and then a meeting at 4.45 and the one at 9 a.m. we talk about what we're going to do and then 4.45 yep. we wrap it up and then we say what we did. So it's nice to do that to stay on track and uh, and my boss and I are always creating new goals together. So it feels like the work that I'm doing really is something that's necessary. So. Uh, yeah, I think that that's just a great way for teams to operate in general, regardless of gender. Um, so I hope that that helps some women out there or men, <laughs> either one. Absolutely. No, that's fantastic. I appreciate you diving into that. And uh, I think it's important to kind of shed light on on, on um, kind of the industry as a whole and and, and not have feeling like anyone should be deterred from trying to get into it. Because I think it's a fascinating space and you can learn a lot. And you know, there's there's tons of tons of opportunity out there for everyone, and and it's it's been awesome to hear a little bit more about what you've done, what you've accomplished, and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time today um, to talk to me. Yeah, of course, it's been a pleasure. Uh, last thing I want you to do, if you wouldn't mind, is just tell our audience where they can learn more about the company, follow up questions, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, sure. All right. So uh, yeah, thanks everyone to thanks everyone for listening to the podcast. Um, you can find us at argentum.ai. So uh, our website again is just argentum.ai. I'm sure that that's going to okay. be in the show notes or something like that. Yep. Uh, yep. We're also very active on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook. I post a lot of memes actually on Twitter because I think that that's a great space for them. So do follow that if you want some tech memes. And uh, follow us on LinkedIn to learn a little bit more about the technology behind our products. And we also have a blog going. I'm posting a lot of our blog articles on Medium now, too. So you can follow us on Medium. We're, we're really active um, in a lot of places. That's awesome. Well, yeah. thank you so much again. We'll make sure our audience has all that information to kind of stay in touch and reach out. Um, and I'd love to have you back sometime later this year so we can learn more about everything you have going on, the company cool. is going on, and uh, stay in touch. Yeah, that would be great. I'd love to do that. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Yes, well, thanks, Aaron. Yeah. Thanks again, Aaron. And um, look forward to uh, talking again soon. Cool. Sounds good. Yeah. Take care. Bye. All right, everyone. Thanks again for watching that episode of the IoT for All podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please click the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and be sure to hit the bell notification so you get the latest episodes as soon as they become available. 
Other than that, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.